All right. So, <coughs> welcome to the class on uh, aircraft design. Today we look at a very important aspect and an aspect about which most people are most curious. That is, how does a designer choose a particular configuration for the aircraft being designed? So, to, before we start, I would like you to remember the definition of configuration. Can someone start the discussion by telling me what is meant by configuration? Anyone? Yes? Selection of components that you want, want in a final design. Okay. Selection of components that you want to be in the design. Uh, all designs are essentially uh, candidates which you evaluate against the customer and awareness requirements. So, the features that you provide in the aircraft such as uh, whether you are going to have a wing or no wing, tail or no tail and if you have a wing will it be a conventional wing, swept forward wing, swept back wing, all these are called as configurations. Okay. So, there are two things in conceptual design as I mentioned, you have to arrive at a configuration and layout that meets the requirements. So, layout we will discuss in a separate lecture, today we will start our discussion on configuration. Now, this particular uh, <coughs> presentation is uh, heavily borrowed from this particular uh, lecture by my friend Professor William Mason of Virginia Tech. He is one of the most distinguished aircraft design teachers in the world today and uh, he has also many popular lectures. So, this is one lecture that is very popular and this is a question which is always in the minds of uh, students, you know. Why do airplanes look like the way they do? Why does a designer choose a specific configuration for a particular aircraft. So, uh, to introduce you, this is Bill Mason who has a very nice web page and that is why I wanted you to uh, keep a note of this on the model when I upload this presentation. I encourage you to go and check his web page for several reasons. One is, this is the best repository available online for information, data, programs, codes, procedures related to aircraft design. So, if you want to do mass estimation, you will find in Bill's page some kind of a formulation or a code. You want to do drive estimation, it will be there. You want some hints about uh, some other activities, it will be there. Reports of his old students, papers that he has written and lectures that he has uh, prepared, all that he has uploaded and he did this or he began doing this much before the websites and internet became very popular. So, even when uh, you know in the early days of my education I found this is the only page at that time available where there is a lot of design data for students and it is all free downloadable. So, it is great that Bill started this particular uh, exercise of sharing information. So, we start with saying thanks to him officially. Right. So, let us start now how a designer starts doing the activities. Okay. So, there is one guy who is the boss. Okay. He is the person who basically decides and you can see his picture also as well as you can see the name there. Right. Now, the question is this designer is interested to know how I can exploit the available technology or available means for me to meet the requirements. The designer cannot just dream about technology, it should be available or it should be there should be a promise of its availability in the near future. So, that is a very big limitation. This depends on two major aspects. One is, are there any advances in technology and on the Moodle page, I am happy to note some of you have started telling us about uh, configurations or requirements which are driven by technology available. Some of you have given very simple examples, some of you have given very detailed examples. So, that is good. Second one, second thing is there might be somebody, someone out there who will have some technology I could just buy or I could make use of that. What comes to my mind is, uh, you see uh, for, for wind tunnel testing in transonic flow, there are very few wind tunnels available in the world where you can get authentic design related data. There are ex many experimental tunnels in institutions, very small cross section, 2 inch, 3 inch, what do you do with that except doing research. So, there is one um, tunnel in Russia called as the Sagi tunnel and it is available, you can you can uh, use it. So, similarly there are many tunnels available all over the world. 
IIT Kanpur has set up a new tunnel a few years ago, which is slowly reaching a level when people can go and get their testing done after making some payment, but it is heavily booked because it is the only facility in the country right now. So, I do not have to necessarily do everything myself. I might be able to identify somewhere where I can get things done. With this, you come with the configuration concept, okay. And then, <coughs> over the last so many years, right from the first design till the current date, all configurations that you see are principally driven by the available technology, okay. Because something is available either as a technology or as a facility that can be used, people say, okay, let us make it. And many examples in what you will see today will come from there, okay. Now, when we look at configuration, you have to first be very clear about how will you arrive at it. Now, in every aircraft design, the central item is the payload. What is payload? How do you define payload? So, what is payload is something. What is it? Basically, for a civilian aircraft, payload can be number of people in cargo that will go. Okay, so you are limiting your discussion to civil aircraft, and you are right. For a civil aircraft, a payload could be the cargo carried in the belly and the people carried it inside the fuselage. Okay, any other example, or any more, any more elaborate? Yes, weapons from military aircraft. But rather than saying cargo weapons, can you give a generic statement which is applicable to both? No, no, not necessarily. It don't don't take it from uh, only that whatever remains is payload. This particular argument is there is something 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 you remove everything whatever remains is payload. Yes. Yeah, the name itself is payload. It is a load for which somebody pays. Simple. Okay, nobody pays an airline to carry a structure. Nobody pays airline to carry the pilot, right? What do they pay for? They pay for the cargo, they pay for the passengers and the baggage. And if you carry more baggage, there is excess baggage charge. So anything for which you are paid is a payload. In every aircraft design, generally the central idea is payload. You can assume that the aircraft is designed surrounded around the payload. Location could be anywhere, but that is the central thing and this comes from the user. Then the next thing is, in most cases, it will be a lifting uh, requirement, okay. If you make an airship, you, there may be no lifting surfaces because the big envelope itself gives you lift, but in general, some kind of a lifting surface arrangement has to be thought of. Can you think of an aircraft without any wings? Why not? All these missiles. Rockets, what are they? Are they aircraft? Yes or no? So, that depends on what is meant by an aircraft. If you say aircraft is something which has wings and tails, then they do not. But if you think aircraft is basically a payload carrier, then yes, they are aircraft without any wings because they do not need aerodynamic wing uh, lift to uh, do their mission. They do it by ballistics or they do it by the rocket thrust. So, there may be a lifting success arrangement that may not be and if it is there, there can be many options which we will see. Then you might need a control surface or surfaces and you must also have some idea in the beginning where I will locate them. So, what options do you have for control surfaces? Where all can you locate them? In other words, where do we locate the control surface in an aircraft? So that is you are assuming there is a wing, you are assuming there is a tail, you are thinking very very conventional, okay. I do not want to think conventional. So can we make a generic statement, control surfaces are kept at extremities because normally we use them with moment, the longer the distance, more will be the moment given everything else remaining same. So either in the nose or in the tail, usually in the tail. Now why mostly in the tail? We will see all that when we look at the configuration. Propulsion system selection, is it essential to have propulsion system? No, no. we have gliders, we do not have a propulsion system, okay. But then what is the problem with them? 
someone has to launch them. Either you have a winch with a cable and you pull it, or you have an aeroplane. So an aircraft is towing another aircraft and then it is launching. And they are the mercy of the ambient winds. They cannot sustain flight in all conditions. But in some conditions, there are people who have flown a glider for seven hours non-stop, nine hours non-stop. So here is a question for you. On the Moodle page, I would like to know, and Sai, please, Hemant, please note down. I want to know what is the record for the long, longest duration flight of a glider. After launch, how many hours it has remained in the air before hitting the ground? Who did it? When? Which glider? And if you can figure out why it happened, what was the reason for it to have had such a large flight? Just for curiosity. Okay. Now, for a propulsion system, there are many choices. So, you may decide not to have, you may decide to have. If you decide to have, you can decide which type, how many, where do we locate them. Location will come in layout. Okay. Landing gear. What is landing gear? There is one more name for it called as undercarriage. Undercarriage. So, uh, landing gear is a term used in US mostly, but if you go to Europe, it is called as the undercarriage. So, in UK, in France, in Germany, you will hear more about undercarriage and US you will hear more about landing gear, but they are both interchangeable. They mean the same thing. So, now question is, do you really need it? Yes or no? How many of you say that you can have aircraft with no landing gear? Raise your hands. Okay, TAs cannot answer these questions because they have undergone the course. Sorry, Himant. Yes. So, the gliding, Loudly. Uh -huh. The glider is doing... If you use human legs in gliders as landing gear. No, no. What you are saying is true not for gliders but paragliders. Okay. Where you have just a person hanging on a sail. There, of course, I agree with you. But when you say glider, you actually mean a big aircraft and they have wheels. So, they, they, they generally have a landing gear. Okay. Any other example of no landing gear? Helicopters. Helicopters have a landing gear. Why not? So, what? They have a skid. That is a landing gear. So, it may not have wheels. Who said that we are talking about? Why do you assume that landing gear means wheels only? Something on which you rest when you land. Helicopters have it, yes. Empty? They also have landing gear. They have those pontoons which could be considered as landing gear appropriate for water, water usage. Hmm. Yes, correct. Very good example. Some UAVs which are launched by a launcher and recovered by a parachute, there is no landing gear. Correct? So, you need not have, you need not have a landing gear. Okay. Now, there is also another good example. The, we also have disposable landing gears. Okay. I will show you some videos of that. Not now, but when I discuss about landing gear design, I will try to have one lecture on landing gear design. There I will show you disposable landing gear. Okay. So, we start with uh, the pioneers. Okay. Let us look at the configuration that they selected and let us try to figure out why they selected this configuration. So, what can you say about the configuration of Wright brothers by looking at the picture? No statement should come from any prior knowledge. It should come only from the picture. You should be able to see what you are saying. So, what is the configuration? How will you describe, how will you describe this configuration to me? One by one. Yeah, raise your hands. One by one. Yes. It is a biplane. Okay. That means there are two wings, one above the other. Okay. What else? First, let us get the, num uh, the details, then we will discuss, discuss why. Biplane, yes. What else? No, <laughs> it is not visible to you, but landing gear is there. It was a skid. The land there was a small skid. So, it is interesting. They were interested simply in flying. Okay. Not necessarily flying again and again. The idea was we want to beat this uh, record of manned flight. So, what they did is they put a small skid 
which is nothing but something that rubs on the ground and comes to a stop. So, it is a skid type landing gear. Okay. What else? Hmm? No vertical tail. No vertical tail is there. It is there in the front. See, this is the vertical tail. It is not there where you want it or where you are looking for. You are looking for it here. It is not there. It is here in the front. Yes. What else? Two propellers. Yes. But how many engines? A single engine. Engine in the center and with pulleys and cables they are driving two propellers. So, there are two propellers, one here, one here and these are driven by a simple belt and pulley arrangement. Okay. So, it is a single engine, it was an IC engine and then what else? What else do you see? Anything else that is visible to you? Do you notice that the wings are not straight? They have a certain they have a very slight downward tilt. What is this called? This is called as anhedral, anhedral, whatever you may call it. Okay. When the wings are not like this, but they are like this. And in many aircraft, you will see dihedral, where the wings are little bit up. Okay. Right. So, let us see now. Uh, their main contribution was or their configuration was driven by an innovative control concept. They were not bothered too much about stability. Why is it so? Why is it so that they were not too much concerned about stability, but they wanted control? Yes? Can you prior knowledge? Yes, you can use prior knowledge, yeah. Mm. No, before that there was no plane deer. Ah, you mean to say gliders. Okay, okay. Right, right. Okay, good. So, they, they discovered that when the aircraft stalls, if the nose goes up, it worsens the situation. So, if I can have a f system by which if the aircraft stalls, the nose comes down, it will be helpful because nose down means lower angle of attack, it will go below stalling angle. So, that is why they built that kind of a configuration. The main reason why Wright brothers did not worry for stability and more about control because they were experienced or adventurous pilots. Stability is needed for basically to allow the pilot to fly. Okay? If an aircraft is unstable, the pilot can still fly it, but then the pilot becomes always in the loop and the pilot continuously starts, the pilot has to continuously give control inputs to overcome the imbalances. So, they were concerned more about ability to fly. So, they said stability is not a problem, we will make it stable. That is why this was a plane which crashed very soon. How many seconds did the flight last? Okay. Why did it last so less? They had a powerful engine, they had a good aircraft, but they crashed because the airplane was highly unstable. So, they were able to momentarily fly it by controlling it. Second thing that they did is they had a very lightweight propulsion system. The engine that they used was adapted from existing engines, very lightweight for its class. And this is why others could not do before them. Other people who were trying to make powered aircraft before them could not succeed because they were not able to get a lightweight engine. So, these guys were smart, they got a lightweight engine. And they were able to improve their design by continuous refinement. They did a lot of wind tunnel testing, they observed a lot about how birds fly and they make their own notes, etc. Okay. So, let us look at some basic laws. Yes. What do you think? Control surface location, should it come under layout or configuration? Layout. Location means relative location basically. So, whenever you talk about location, where to put it, it is layout. What to put is configuration. Okay. Right. If the, if the engine was left on, why did you Ha, please answer this question. If the engine was only one, then why did I brothers use two propellers instead of one propeller? So, look at the configuration and then you will try to get the answer yourself. Yes. Probably because one of them sets in the middle and if the propeller is just up, uh, in front of it, the crash the propeller may have. Exactly. It is because of safety. They wanted to keep the propellers away and when you keep them away, you cannot have only one of them, it is asymmetric. 
So you have to have minimum two or four or whatever. So they had only one engine. They had no room for second engine, and the engine was mounted low. Right. So they said, if if we are sitting behind or near the engine, and if we have a single propeller, it is going to hit the ground first of all. Notice by putting the props on the wing, you also move the propellers up. So the props are here on top. Otherwise, they would have been here. So it would have hit the ground. Yes. Yeah, you can, but when you make a pusher configuration, then you have a problem of center of gravity shift behind. And pilots are, or designers are always concerned about CG going back. So we will talk about pusher versus tractor when we come to engine configuration. Okay. So there are some basic laws which I borrowed from uh, Bill Mason. Okay, and not only Bill Mason, he borrowed it from John McMaster's. He's a very distinguished designer from Boeing Aircraft Company. So <clears throat> there are two golden rules. If you cannot build it, then you cannot sell it, obviously. Okay, because if you can't build it, then who will who is going to buy it? And simplicity is very important. Any attempt to complicate the design is going to make it costly, is going to make it less attractive. And all attempts to make it simple are going to improve its sellability and its workability, but not at the cost of safety. So it's good to make things very simple. All right. Now, when you look at specialization, when you look at uh, you know you when you look at different people, when you end up a situation where everyone wants the aircraft to be good in their department or in their specialization, and this cartoon from Miller, okay, is borrowed from Miller. It's like it's called a dream airplanes. So, various groups who specialize in various aspects of aircraft, they have their own dream planes. Now, if you do not work with proper coordination, you will end up being in this particular picture. And um, the the main job of the chief designer or the boss is essentially to ensure that this doesn't happen. Now, all of you have experienced this uh, delta design exercise or delta design game. So, do you remember now? If one of the four disciplines starts dominating, the design actually is a failure. It's only when all of them work together, there is a give and take, you have a successful design. Do you remember that? Okay. So the purpose of that game was only to give you this particular feel by practical working. So to avoid this, we need to understand that we have to work together. Yeah. Loft group. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there is something called as aircraft lofting. Lofting basically means arriving at the contour arriving at the shape. So earlier there used to be some groups who were working in the design, drawing and uh, drawing and layout group. Their job was they would put on paper the contour of the aircraft. So obviously they want everything to be straight because it is easy to make a straight uh, line on the piece of paper. Okay. Look at power plant group. Okay. Now there is an aircraft which is looking like this in real life. Do you know which one is it? Okay, should I give it to you as a, a question in Moodle? Figure out an aircraft that is nothing but a small aircraft designed around the engine. And I will give you a hint, it is not a bad design, it is not a bad design. It is a very well thought out design. That aircraft, now what will happen if the aircraft is dominated by the propulsion group? What will happen? Why would it be less? So it's okay. It's okay. I will drive it by the engine. I don't. I don't. I don't have to drive it by anything else. So which kind of aircraft do you think will look like this? Solar plane will need more area, and more area you can't have a something like this. If you are designing an aircraft, for what application or for what kind of aircraft will you? end up with something like this, yes. Exactly, for race, for races, correct. So figure out and put on model the picture of an aircraft that looks like this. It is meant for, it is high performance aircraft, it is actually for races. Okay, I will not give you any more hints. All right. 
So let's look at the features of a good aircraft. Now, do you call these as good aircraft? Okay, one is Airbus 380, the other is what is the other one? Boeing is a company, yeah? don't tell me Boeing. Dreamliner 787. How do you say it's a Dreamliner? What distinguished flight factor is there in that picture? Wingless are there in so many aircraft, including 777. Well, this is something that you acquire over a uh, over time. So, why do we say that these are good aircraft? This is just a statement. You can counter it. You can say, no, they are not good aircraft. So, these are the features. Now, if they have these features, then we will call them as good aircraft. First of all, they should be aerodynamically efficient and they should have very nice integration between the aerodynamics and the propulsion. This is called as the uh, engine airframe integration. Okay. So, in both these cases, there are these beautifully shaped nacelles which are mounted below the wing. Right. Then, when they fly, they should have a trim position where the drag is minimum somewhere near the stability level. So, they should not they should not fly with a trim angle of 10 degrees or 8 degrees because that will create very high drag. So, when the so the, the center of gravity location should be such that when the aircraft is trimmed, it has got a very low angle of attack, preferably zero angle of attack, so that during the trimmed flight it has minimum drag. So if there is a landing gear, it should be located relative to CG to allow the rotation at takeoff. If you have if you have the landing gear uh, at some other odd location, then it may be difficult to rotate. Now, sometimes you are forced to put landing gear elsewhere. Sometimes because that area is occupied by something else. A designer would like to put landing gear just near the center of gravity because that will be the best location for the landing gear. That will give the least load on the landing gear also. But if it is not possible, then you have other configurations. And then throughout the flight envelope, throughout all the height and velocity uh, combinations at which you want to fly this aircraft, you must have adequate control authority. And you should always have easy to build. I told you the first thing that you do in design is ability to or it should be possible to build in large numbers at low cost and also it should have low maintenance cost. Now, these two aircraft have been considered to be meeting almost all these requirements and so many others. They are not the only two aircraft which are good aircraft. There are many. So, keep in mind these features when you look at an aircraft and if you get these, if you get tick marks on all of these, then it is by and large a good design. And in current day situation, noise and emissions are also very important because they are the environmental considerations. And it is not enough for you to just meet the norms. See, meeting the norms is minimum. You have to exceed the norms. You have to you have to meet the norms with a lot of margin. Margin allows you to grow, and margin allows you to compete with the competitor in the market. So two aircraft, everything else remaining same. If one is less, less noisy, and have low emissions they will be preferred because you can use the green advantage of that and push it in the marketplace. Okay. These are the three technologies which are key. You all know about it. And these technologies were prominent in the beginning, right from the beginning of aviation. You do not see controls here, right? Because controls was considered in the beginning as an add-on to provide something to allow it to fly. In the late 70s, flight controls became gaining importance and they, they, they began appearing as a dis Earlier controls were a part of aerodynamics only. But in, in 70s or so, the requirements on the controls became so prominent that they, became, they began becoming a separate discipline. Then in the 80s and 90s, systems, avionics, manufacturing and observability, stealth, these started becoming important considerations in design. But stealth is suitable or applicable only for military aircraft and that too of a particular type. Now, today what is important or what is most prominent is the process itself, the way in which you do design. Today we do aircraft design using what is called as a multidisciplinary design optimization approach in which we do not look at individual disciplines in a sequential fashion. I showed you a graph. 
we look at all at once or there are multiple disciplines which are interacting with each other and you set up methods to interact. Now this is not very easy. It might sound very simple, but it is very, very tricky to take care of this. So when you today talk about a typical transport aircraft, you have a baseline. So which aircraft comes to your mind when you say a classical or a typical transport aircraft? Hercules is not the answer. Hercules is one of the unique special aircraft. It is not a typical aircraft. What a typical aircraft? If I ask you to sketch a typical transport aircraft, what will you draw? Hmm? 747? Why 747? Because it has become now something like a benchmark for a basic aircraft configuration. Right? This is the aircraft that has revolutionized air transport in the last few years. So what is so special or what is conventional? Now if this is conventional, let us first define conventional because only then we can define unconventional. So if this is conventional, what do you see here? Swept wing. So the swept wing now not every aircraft will have sweep, it will be only if needed. Okay. So let us look at the general things first. The payload is distributed around the center of gravity, some in the front, some on the back. Then you have a longitudinal control power from tail, so tails are on the back side. So when you have tail on the rear, it is conventional. Anywhere else, it is unconventional. You have a vertical tail, single vertical tail for direction stability, rudder for control. So a single vertical tail mounted behind on what is called as a conventional tail layout. Tail on the back, one vertical tail, two horizontal tails, that is called as a conventional tail. And when you are neutrally stable, at that point you have the minimum drag. That is a normal, normally that is what you get in these kind of aircraft. And you have this wing fuselage landing gear setup. This is what works. So these are the things that constitute a classical or a standard. Now this particular shape, it has emerged after a lot of historical evaluations and analysis. It has not simply come by one person's imagination. So no one took a piece of paper and the pen and said, okay, here is it, this is the design. If you look at the earlier designs of even 747, you will find there will be slight changes. But this is where the technology kind of stops as a conventional. So there must be some reason for it. So let us look at, let us look at this and find out what are the good things. So we notice here, can you tell me about the layout now, little bit about layout. What kind of a wing layout do you have here? we have a low wing with dihedral. Okay. So that means low wing with dihedral is a good feature in most conventional transport aircraft. There must be a solid reason for it. If there was not a reason for it, we would not converge on this particular shape. One minute. You look at 747, you look at 787, you look at Airbus A380, very similar. Maybe there are two engines or four engines, but they look very similar. That means two independent design teams have come to almost the same conclusion. There are minor variations, obviously, but they all look very similar. Yes, you have a question. What do you think? Is dihedral a configuration point or a layout point? How many of you feel it is configuration? Raise your hands. Okay. And the remaining people feel it is dihedral? or you do not care whether it is configuration or how does it matter. So what do you think? How many of you think it is a layout feature, dihedral? Raise your hands. Nothing to be afraid of. I am not going to cut any marks from your mid or something if you answer wrongly. Okay. I will repeat, layout is only relative location. So dihedral is not a layout feature. It is a configurational feature because it does not tell you that 
the diet will start from the bottom of the wing or top of the wing? Yes. No. There are many aircraft which are high wing and they do not have any hydro. Dornier 228 on which I have worked. So, you cannot say that every every aircraft with high wing has a dihedral, uh, an hydral. And you cannot say that every aircraft with a low wing has dihedral. In general, we have. There are reasons. See, we are going to study all this. I just want you to first figure out that this is conventional and this has not come by imagination. This has come as the end of iteration, not as the beginning of iteration. So, there must be a solid reason. Okay. Now, what is the reason you may not know? For example, can somebody answer here? Why is it low wing? Why low wing is supposed to be very useful for such big aircraft? It turns out that a low wing configuration gives you the minimum structural weight. Okay. Now, you cannot you cannot understand this unless you do the numbers. Now, in this course, you cannot do these numbers because to actually get the detailed structural weight, you need to do a complete structural analysis, which we cannot do. So, for the same requirements, if you do a proper detailed design of the aircraft, and if you come up with a weight estimation, you will generally find that a low wing configuration will be the lightest. Not for every aircraft, for large capacity transport aircraft. That is why both Airbus and Boeing have frozen to this configuration. Why does it have a dihedral? What do you think? Clearance issues to what? To the engines. Okay. That means engines are mounted below the wing right that is decided first and then to give adequate clearance to the engines you would be putting dihedral okay you may not give dihedral only for that reason you may give dihedral for other reasons like stability stability in roll dihedral imparts you a good lateral stability so but it also supports the mounting of wings, uh, engines below the wings. So now why are the wings below the engines? Okay, we will study all that. All of these things are related. I want you to look at the tail, horizontal tail. What do you see? The horizontal tail is mounted on the fuselage in the center line, two surfaces. And vertical tail is mounted one surface on the top of the fuselage. There is a reason for this. There are many types of tail configurations. We will study all of them. But 70 percent of the aircraft have this configuration. Why? Because this is considered to be the most is efficient and easy to build, easy to maintain, easy to design structure. So, if there is no need to depart from this, you should not depart from it. Just for the heck of having an unconventional shape, if you say no, I will make my tail somewhere, you should justify the reason for it. Okay, let us move ahead. Enough, we have spent enough time on discussing this configuration. Let us look at the options. So, where do you put the wings? Where do you put the engines? So, which engines is a configurational issue? Where engines is a layout issue? Control surfaces, then you should have enough room for the landing gear. And can you bring in innovation if it helps meet your requirements better? Innovation per se is meaningless. Innovation per se is not going to give you anything unless, unless you are in a competition or a race where innovation is the first criteria. Suppose there is a customer who says, I want an aircraft that looks totally unconventional and I give 80 percent weightage for that. Then you have a mandate okay. and I will show you two aircraft which are designed. So, we will just try to list down some of the questions which typically come in the minds of students. And then over the next few slides, we will try to answer each of these questions. Okay. Now, many of these questions you are expected to already know, but you will not know the answers merely by doing coursework. That is an honest and truthful statement that all the coursework that you do, when you do it sincerely, you get A grade in all of them, still you may not be answer, able to answer all the questions. To answer these questions, apart from good academic uh, preparation, you also need curiosity. You also need a desire to know. So, I know in the class not everybody may be interested in aerospace engineering. That is why I see people with their heads down. 
there are some students, they also know, I also know, throughout the lecture their head is down, not interested. So, whatever I may do, I may do a tamasha here, I may do a mujra here, they will still not look at this side because their interest is somewhere else. There are some students who are constantly looking at me or in the slides because they are completely interested. So, if you are interested, you will know some answers, you may guess some answers. If you are not interested, you may be a 10 pointer, you will not know the answers. My job in this course is to expose you to these answers, whether you like it or not. At the end of this course, you should and you will know these answers. You may forget, you may not write in the examination, but at least you will be exposed to these answers. That is my job as a teacher of aircraft design. You should know, why do we have pilot engines below the wings? Okay. So, is there any word in this slide which you do not understand? Pod it basically means with nacelle. And see, basically a pod is um, a pod is a covering. Right? So, if you expose the engine without any nacelle, it is called as unpodded engine. So, normally we have podded engines. Why do we put a nacelle on an engine? Correct. So, one is safety. That if there is a breakage of a turbine blade or a compressor blade or any component of the engine, because it is a high sport, what is the RPM at which the blade uh, blades move? 60,000, 40,000, okay. At that RPM, if a small projectile comes and hits the fuse lock, it will go inside. So, one is containment, but that is only one reason. That is something much more fundamental than that. Aerodynamics, because you do not want to have a dirty hanging engine which will have extremely high drag. So, you put a nice aerodynamically smooth fairing on it. So, that is called as a pod. Okay. You understand swept wing? You understand forward sweep, variable sweep? Yes. Answers will come in the next few slides. I am asking you, is there any word in this slide which you do not understand? Hmm? Three surfaces. Okay. So, normally you see wings and tail. You may have wing and horizontal, wing and tail behind or wing and canard, but there are some aircraft which have canard and wing and tail, okay. This is, they are called as three surface aircraft. There is a reason for it. What are canards? Canards are basically control surfaces. Now, I should correct myself. It is not just control surfaces. Sometimes you have a canard not for control, but for just giving some other purpose. So, if they are mounted in the front, not on the back, they are called as canards. Okay. Right, let us move ahead. The first question that people had is why put engines in pods on the wings? So, this we have already discussed. If you put them below the wing, then you are relieving the wing of some bending moment. Because the wing is designed to take a large amount of vertical load, you hang a heavy weight below it, it will relieve it. Then there is a general feeling that if you put it below the wings and if you give dihedral, then access to that becomes very easy, okay, for maintenance purposes. Safety, so that during any crash landing, etc., if the wing is mounted in the fuselage, maybe if there is any problem with the engine, the engine, the aircraft will catch fire. Here the wings are a little bit far away. And also, you can design it to create low drag. Now, that is a beauty. You may expect that mounting the engine below the wing will increase the drag, but it is possible to do a very careful design. Design the, the design, the, um, there is a pylon which is the link between the, the wing and the engine. By designing it very beautifully and carefully, you can actually have a very low drag system, and that is what most people have done. Okay. The original idea was to have the wings embedded inside in the, sorry, the engines embedded at the root of the wing. Now, do you recognize this aircraft? Anybody? This is a very path breaking aircraft. This is the aircraft which gave the flavor of intercontinental flight for the first time to passengers. This is the Comet. Okay. First aircraft which was used by passengers for transatlantic flight and long distance flight. But it became a failure because of many reasons. Okay, there are there is a very interesting story about the structural uh, fatigue that brought comets down. And uh, there is a very beautiful book which I read as a student. I recommend all of you to read the book. It's called as No Highway. 
the name of the book is no highway and uh, it explains uh, very nicely in the form of a sto story how um, how this designer figures out that there is going to be a fatigue problem and he is in the aircraft, he is flying in the aircraft and he knows that this aircraft is prone to fatigue but he is not able to raise his voice because he is one of the juniors in the design department. So what does he do? I do not want to you know, give you a spoiler. Read the book, No Highway, very beautiful book, talks about aircraft fatigue. So <clears throat> Dan Air London is one of the airlines and aircraft was commercially not very successful. One reason is horrible to maintain because to, main, to reach the engine was very difficult and the root portion of the fuselage was very hot, it used to become dark black because of heating effects. So originally the wing was supposed to be mounted. Now what do you think was the reason? Why did they started with this kind of a wing, this kind of an engine configuration? They thought it will be low drag because the engines are now submerged inside the, inside the wing. So they thought that if you suspend there will be more drag, if you put it inside you are going to shield it. Also less moment arm problem because they are located near the fuselage. If one of them does not work, the yaw moment will be less. So the vertical tail you can see is quite small. Okay. If it is small, if the aircraft is small and if you hang it below the wings, they will touch the ground. So one very good design in the recent times by Honda Jet is to put the wings, uh, to put the engines over the wing with a pylon. Just reverse the position. This is a very good case study in design. I will spend some time in design, discussing this aircraft and uh, its uh, design and I will upload on Moodle some documents and some papers about this aircraft design. Right. Boeing was the first company that was able to figure out how to have efficient podded engines mounted below the wings. They started with 707. This is Boeing 707. They made it work. Now notice carefully. Uh, the engine is somewhere here, okay. This is the nozzle on the back. So the wing is here. So the engine is mounted below and ahead. Why is it ahead? To reduce the interference and to ensure that the engine gets clean flow. If you mount the engine exactly below the wing, then it will get disturbed flow. So to ensure that the engine inlet gets clean flow, they have mounted the engine ahead. So they have actually mounted it like this, it is not below, it is actually little bit ahead. So the aerodynamic design of this pylon is a very important uh, aspect and through a lot of internal testing and CFD analysis, they were able to arrive at the optimum location of uh, optimum design of the pylon which gives you least interference. Now look. Uh, you can, we will study about uh, aerodynamic interference and typically it is said that if, if there is a body which is suspended or attached to the wing or fuselage and if it is located one diameter away, then the interference drag greatly reduces. So you can notice this is just approximately one diameter of the engine below. You bring it any nearer, you will start getting more interference drag. You take it much larger, then you will have problem of hitting the ground and unnecessary extra weight of the pylon. So it has been optimized for the correct and the optimum location. Okay, you must have heard about sweeping the wing. Okay, this wing, do you have, do you think there is a sweep in this wing? Is it swept or not? Is it heavily swept or mildly swept? Mildly. Very mildly swept. Okay. Now when do you decide that there is a sweep? Do you look at the leading edge or the trailing edge? At the quarter cord. So, you can have a wing which has got a sweep at leading edge and sweep at trailing edge but actually no sweep. Yeah, if the quarter cord is straight, unswept, right? You may have, isn't it? You may have a wing which has got very sharp taper. So the leading edge will have sweep, the trailing edge also will have sweep but the wing is unswept. So you have to look at the quarter cord. So the angle made by the quarter cord with the fuselage axis is an indication of whether it is swept or not. So in subsonic aircraft, we sometimes give sweep, sometimes. This is an example, this aircraft is subsonic, but there is still a small amount of sweep. 
So, what do you think is the benefit of giving slight sweep in subsonic aircraft? We all know that for high speed aircraft you need to give sweep back. But why do you give sweep back in a, in a low speed aircraft? No, S sorry, sweep is a disaster for lift because it gives you low DCL by D alpha. There is an aerodynamics knowledge. You should not make this statement. Sweep back is going to give you lower DCL by D alpha, so it will not give you good lift. Hmm? Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Critical Mach number is no, normally how much? This is low sweep, this is low speed aircraft, sir. The maximum speed will be 0.4 Mach number. There is no critical Mach number problem. I am asking you a very specific question. I am not asking generally why do you sweep, that everybody knows. Why do you sweep in a low speed aircraft, yes. Do you agree that if you sweep the wing, you move the control surface behind, ones will go behind. If they go behind, there will be larger moment arm, okay, agreed? No. But no, because ailerons are actually going to give you roll, they will be nearer if you sweep them. Wait a minute, when you deflect the ailerons, then right, that is what that is what it is. Basically, so is it to do with the aileron or to do with the elevator? Uh, so, what is it to do with aileron or uh, some other some other aspect? Okay, fine. So, yes, you are right. One reason why you can provide small amount of sweep, see sweep back is not desirable. What is the repression of sweep? Sweep back gives you higher weight also. The wing is heavier if you sweep it. Why is it heavy? Yeah. So, at the moment, if you have no sweep, you have wings like this. Now, if you have wings on the back, what will happen is, there will be also a moment. So, additional work for the wing fuselage joint. So, the wing will be heavier. The structure will be heavier. Okay. Interestingly, if you see sweep back in a low speed aircraft, one reason could be the designers could not control the center of gravity and now they cannot do anything except just giving a small sweep. So, 3 degree sweep, 4 degree sweep that you see in many aircraft, it could be because of poor CG control, okay. And if you have a flying wing, now what you said is applicable in a flying wing, you get a larger moment arm for control because in a flying wing you do not have an elevator. In the conventional aircraft it is not going to be useful. So, that is why you will not see sweep back in most low speed aircraft, only in some you will see for any of these two reasons, okay. Now, let us look at transonic flight. In transonic flight we have significant sweep, the number which varies from 30 to 35 degrees, okay. So, here we have what you said the uh, issue of drag divergence mark number. But uh, I asked this question to you in the quiz also. What is meant by drag divergence mark number? So, can everybody answer this question? What is meant by drag divergence mark number? Okay, let me ask that lady there. Yes, can you answer the question? Yeah, I am asking you. First of all, what is my question? Please define it. When there is a sharp change in the drag with respect to Mach number, okay. So, uh, is there some definition for sharp change? How much is sharp? Okay. So, you, 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 you can find out. The answer is correct that it is a Mach number, it is a free stream Mach number at which there is a sudden increase in the drag, okay. But we need to also know what should be the rate of change of drag with Mach number. What is the D C D by D M? When you can say yes, now it is a sharp change. So, you have to figure this out also, right. Let us look at uh, now, this is an example of a transonic aircraft. Most of the aircraft that you fly in airliners, they fly at what is the maximum Mach number of most of these transport aircraft? 0.85 is on the higher side, 0.82 is normally or 0.83 is normally the upper limit at which they fly. 
uh, because at 0.85 you will start experiencing too much of drag. So 0.8, so, so that is the Mach number at which if you design the aircraft to fly without uh, having lot of transonic effects. So in, in supersonic aircraft you have very large sweep, 45 degree sweep to 70 degree sweep. So there you have to load the wing laterally as well as longitudinally and there you have an area rule where you would like to have uh, the variation of cross sectional area along the length is very important for transonic drag rise. So we will study this in more detail. So please note the bottom line that wing sweep is only to be given when needed. Never, I would just say never give wing sweep. Never give wing sweep if you can live without it. Because except for the aerodynamic benefits and very minor CG control benefits, everything about sweep is bad. It is bad structurally, it is bad from controls because it makes the aircraft more flexible, controls less effective, okay. It makes the aircraft heavy, so do not give it an aerodynamic uh, lift ability of the aircraft reduces. So nothing is good except transonic drag rise or aerodynamic drag in supersonic conditions. So only for those aircraft we are going to give, okay. Sweep forward, have you seen any aircraft with sweep forward? Two of them. So now let us see. Let us just see. We have a small video just to change. Uh, just see why why they have to. For six years, flights have been made by a pair of X-29 aircraft from the desert lake bed at NASA's Dryden Flight Research Facility. This highly sophisticated experimental plane flies in the footsteps of new aircraft series aircraft which push the lots of speed and altitude and maneuverability. technology because its thin wings, close coupled canards, the smaller movable surfaces in front of the wings and rear straight flaps make it naturally unstable. I just want you to see we are not seeing the movie for fun, we are seeing it for learning. So I am going to interrupt it and I am going to important thing. Now this is a canard but it is a very special canard, it is called as a close coupled canard. So there are two kinds of canards. We have a control canard, okay, and we have a lifting canard. So in a lifting canard, you are using the canard just to generate a lift force, but it is in the front, so it gives you nose up. In a control canard, we are not using it for lift generation, we are using it for creating control movements and control forces. And even when you have control canards, there are various types. One of them is called as a close coupled canard. Now in a close coupled canard, there is a direct and positive coupling between the canard and the lifting surface. So the wake of the canard is intentionally made to fall on the wing. The aim is to energize the wing from the wake of the canard. It is like an aerodynamic jhadu, okay. It is a broom which will clear away all the separated and disturbed flows which may present at that reason because of the sweep. See when you provide sweep you have a tendency of the flow to flow along the cord. So this, this close coupled canard is now, now you watch very carefully. And we are straight collapse we can naturally unstable in the Notice, notice these canards are going to constantly flutter in flight, okay. Observe. They, now I wanted to look only at the canards in the flight. Forty times in a second in this aircraft, the control system determines at what angle the canard should be deflected to create a moment to balance. The aircraft is naturally unstable inherently unstable aircraft. Stability is being imparted by artificial means, by 
the generation of the moments by the The computer is as necessary to fly the airplane as the hydraulic system is that actually moves the actuators. Steve Ishmael, one of the program's principal test pilots, has experienced the benefits of combining new interrelated technology into one airplane. It gets at another advance in technology where you see the interaction, for instance, between the canard and this forward sweep. And, and, that's, and that's very, very complex, uh, and it varies as your angle attack and your mock changes. Uh, that's part of the beauty and the power of the art of designing airplanes. So what do you have in the front? All these things that you see in the front. The advantage of a forward part of the beauty and the power of the art of designing airplanes. Notice, this plane is not a plane which is used by the Air Force. Okay, it's an X plane. So it's an experimental plane. So they have put all these kinds of, this is a pitot-static tube. On that they have mounted turn indicate, turn and bank calculation or uh, sensors for calculating what is the alpha, what is the beta, etc. But they will not fly like this when you fly. The advantage of a forward swept design is that air moving over the wing tends to flow inward rather than outward. This allows airflow to remain smooth around the wing tips and makes the X-29 flow to remain. Notice, this is the canard, this is the wing. They are so near to each other. And there is a cut given in the wing to accommodate the contour of the canard. You can see there is a there is a highly swept portion on the stub wing and then sweep forward. Smooth around the wing tips and makes the X-29 easier to control than extreme the So two things, computer controlled flight control system and the use of composites in wings. X-29 was never intended to be in military service. No X-plane is supposed to be in a military service. They are all experimental. Their idea is some new technology has to be tested. So you never see them in the Air Force. You only see them with NASA or with some other agencies because they are basically Okay, now, so you have now seen, you have now seen an American aircraft which is forward swept. Now notice, I will show you a Russian aircraft which is swept forward. Notice the difference between the two, okay? Okay. This is just from an air show. Вот вы видите, отрабатывают форсаж двигатель, и машина мгновенно практически поднимается в воздух. Происходит это за счет... Происходит, поднимается в воздух. Двигатель и машина... What are, what are these white things? These two white conical things, which are offset from the engine. These are the drag parachutes, which are used for landing. И на взлет уже на исполнительный старт выходит... Совершенно уникальная машина, которую называют прообразом истребителя пятого поколения по количеству новых технологий. Машина ОКБ Сухого Су-47, Беркут. Вот вы видите, отрабатывают форсаж двигатель, и машина мгновенно практически... So this aircraft has conventional horizontal tail. It has a tail outboard of both the engines. It has two vertical tails. What did we see in X-29? Происходит это за счет уникальной аэродинамической компоновки. Су-47 это, это, если можно сказать, реализованная мечта всех конструкторов, когда-либо занимавшихся, занимавшихся такими самолетами. Обратная стреловидность крыла, над которой бились лучшие умы, была реализована только у нас в России. И только благодаря тому, что удалось наконец-то создать те материалы, которые не позволяют крылу 
разрушаться при больших нагрузках. What, we... what are these things? Yeah. So what are they used for? Not bombs, missiles. So they are used, these are magnesium flares, mostly magnesium alloy because it burns very bright light and with high heat generation. The aim is to misguide the heat seeking missiles. They are called as chaff, C-H-A-F-F. Now, do you think this canard is also a close couple canard? Yes, it is. How do you know if a canard is close coupled or not? If it is close, <laughs> if it is nearby, if this canard was meant for control purposes, I would put it right in the front to get more momentum. So, because it is not very far away, not near the nose, I know it is a close couple canard. Intentionally, I want the wake of this or the vertices from this to, at, to hit on the wing. So, they have gone for a twin engine configuration with twin vertical tails. You can see how it is deflected. You can see how Михаил Асланович, остается устойчивое мнение, что лучшие самолеты на Западе, но это же не так. Многие, кто здесь в России по-прежнему, я в этом уверен, является передовой авиационной державой. И возможности наших комплексов ни в чем не уступают возможностям комплексов, которые создаются нашими зарубежными партнерами. И когда мы говорим о будущем авиации, то я убежден в том, что сохранившийся научно-технический потенциал нашей авиационной промышленности... Both of them are having forward sweep, okay. Now, whether it is single engine or two engine depends on the requirements. Uh, there could be a requirement saying I want a multi-engine aircraft, so then you have to have two engines. What are the basic differences in the flight control system between that of X-29 and that of Sukhoi? Also, I want you to notice that even the leading edge of the wing has got a huge flap here which is deflecting. So, it is important for us to learn differences between these two aircraft. So, on the Moodle page, Hemant, please put this. Now, I am not looking at just blind data, you know, the weight is so much, this weight is so much. There are two engines, there is one engine. That is not the thing. From the forward swept configuration point of view, what are the key differences? You will be amazed when you learn about the Russian design. All right. Now, let us look at variable sweep. Okay. Variable sweep is basically a system by which you can sweep the, you can, you can sweep the aircraft uh, wing. Either you keep it in the normal configuration unswept or slightly swept or highly swept. Okay. So once again, let us have a look at this uh, video which shows the working. You see now the wing is being swept forward. So, I will show it once again because it went in a flash. The difference here is very clear. There is some inner wing which is fixed. The stub wing is fixed. It is the outer wing which is sweeping. And interestingly, the outer wing is sweeping along with the armament pods. Notice that the swept portion also includes these armaments. Now, in MiG-27, the Russians have designed the wing in such a way that you cannot mount any armament on the wing. It does not sweep with the bombs. They have mounted bombs at different locations and on the fixed portion. All right. So, sweep back is basically like presenting the aircraft in the best configuration during various missions of flight.
this is like morphing this is the beginning of morphing of an aircraft morphing means shape changing so you change the shape of the aircraft so unswept position is meant for low speed flight what is f14 tomcat used for it's a ship born aircraft so therefore you need a very short take off and landing you need low landing speed on a carrier so that you achieve by sweeping it at low condition right and at low speed so low speed flight that will be take off landing and low speed flight will be with low sweep then during transonic flight we need a sweep of around 45 degrees for better maneuverability and combat efficiency so during combat this aircraft will have a 45 degree sweep and then when you finish the work and you want to just rush back home safety at that time you need a high speed flight for that there is a maximum sweep position and at this at this condition the aircraft becomes almost like a delta wing you look at the configuration it becomes almost like a delta wing when it is at the rear most position but obviously providing sweep back is not free of cost it adds cost it adds complexity and currently it is unfashionable no modern aircraft you will see with sweep back this technology has been tried and the conclusion is that by and large it is an inefficient way of providing efficient aerodynamic configuration so no new aircraft is swept back mi 27 also is a very old aircraft and we have worked on that in hl nasik and we have also concluded that the the complexity and the problems with the sweep back mechanism or the sweeping mechanism are so enormous that the benefits perhaps may not be really worthwhile so no modern aircraft has variable sweep okay then we come to canards we have a few minutes remaining we come to canards so i mentioned this is a picture of uh, illusion 144 tu 144 okay uh, it shows the nose of the aircraft which can be bent down and also you see a canard here with a very a full span flap and huge curvature so these are basically trim trim surfaces they are not meant for control they are for trim. so it reduces the shift ac shift see you know that when aircraft flies supersonic the aerodynamic center moves to half of the cord from quarter cord in supersonic flight so that will entail tremendous amount of shift in the moment imbalance so if you have a small surface located far away in the nose you can use it to trim out that particular thing okay <clears throat> now there are drawbacks the first drawback is that the downwards from the canard unloads the wing so this in some cases we want the download we want the we want the canard to actually energize the wing as i mentioned in the previous case but in most cases we don't want aerodynamic interference so when it is undesirable at that time you pay a price for interference between the aerodynamics of the canard and that of the wing and there are problems in obtaining lateral and directional characteristics so then when do we use it we use it when there is a severe requirement on uh, transonic maneuvering and supersonic cruising at which so if there is a need to fly supersonic and if there is a need for very high transonic maneuvering at that time these are very useful other than that they are not but this is only for military aircraft for transport aircraft canards also give you a configuration which is difficult to stall okay so when the angle of attack of the aircraft increases near stall canard is in the front it will be at a higher angle of attack it will stall first when it stalls first the nose will come down so you will not be allowed to go at high angle of attack this is the reason why bert rotan a very famous designer uses canard in many of aircraft that he has designed for small aircraft okay now let's look at a flying wing what's a flying wing no fuselage no tail the control surfaces are embedded on the rear of the wing let's look at testing of one flying wing
This is Northrop, the very famous person who has got this company. A German airman is trying out his novel machine at Cologne. It is in effect a pair of rigid wings without body or tail. Towed aloft by another plane, this machine flies under its own power if necessary, but it's been tested for stability, so it glides. A striking picture of the machine in flight before a faultless landing on its single wheel completes a successful experiment. Very old video, historical video showing testing of a flying wing. So, when you remove fuselage, you re improve the efficiency because fuselage is nothing but a cylindrical body which creates drag. You need it because you have to put equipment and passengers and things there. But if you can fit them in the wing, then fuselage is an unnecessary appendage. Okay? So, you can throw it away if you can. It gives you higher aerodynamic efficiency. Okay. Secondly, if you have a flying wing, then you can actually provide stability using the control surfaces on the back. In a military aircraft, a flying wing gives you stealth because there are less surfaces from where it can, uh, it can you know, uh, there are less surfaces from where it can reflect. So, it is very compact and it gives you better signature. For commercial aircraft, a flying wing allows you to distribute the load on the entire aircraft. Today what is happening is the major payload is distributed on the fuselage and the wings only have fuel. So, how much is the fuel? Fuel will be probably 20 percent of the aircraft weight, 15 percent, 20 percent in a typical aircraft. So, 20 percent is on the wing, remaining is on the fuselage, it is a lopsided distribution. So, structurally it is not a uniform distribution. There is something called as a span layer concept where the whole span is loaded. That happens when you have a uh, distributed. But then there is a problem with center of gravity because now all over the aircraft you have distribution. So, it is difficult to have center of gravity. Uh, I think we will stop today after we discuss this particular aircraft. Many of you must be wondering what is this three surface aircraft. Uh, I want you to get familiar with this fantastic aircraft called as Avanti. This is one example of a marvelous design, very well thought out of design, technical success but commercial failure. Okay. This is the Gates Piaggio Avanti. What do you observe in the figure? First is that the engine is mounted behind, so it is a pusher configuration. What else do you see? T tail, it is called as a T tail, high. The horizontal tail is moved up. Okay. Then do you notice that the wings seem to be very small? These are very special wings. We will read about them. We also see a moustache or a canard, a small canard in the front. Now this canard, is it a control canard? Is it a close couple canard? No. This is basically only a lifting canard or a, it is just, just a small canard in the front which gives you the required trim as well as it alleviates, it, it, it relieves it relieves the wing of some lifting force. Now, the beauty of a three surface aircraft is that if you have a two surface aircraft, there is a limited center of gravity range on which you can trim the aircraft because your trimming moment is coming from the tail. But if you have two tails, then the center of gravity range which you can trim can be larger. Okay. Then, by very careful design as in this case, you can make the aircraft lighter. So, you have three surfaces, but the two surfaces front tail and the back tail are lighter than just a single tail. It can happen. Now, which way is it flying? Is it flying towards the left side or the right side? Okay, very interesting because by conventional looks, you can say it is a canard in the front and there is a tail in the back and there are two engines moving it forward. Let us get familiar with this beautiful aircraft. This is one of my favorite aircraft. The original Piaggio Avanti P180 twin turboprop pusher first flew in 1986 and was certified in 1990. Yet this 2001 model 
still looks as futuristic as it did more than a quarter of a century ago. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this aircraft is still aerodynamically in a class of its own. The small forward lifting wing means that the rear horizontal stabilizer is also a lifting surface, resulting in a 34% decrease in main wing area. Even the fuselage itself is shaped to add to the aircraft's total lift. The narrow cord wing ensures that the laminar flow is maintained to around 50% of wing cord, compared with around 20 to 25% for conventional tractor turboprops, where the propeller wash disturbs the airflow over the wing. An underlying reason for its ability to maintain laminar flow is the quality of the surface finish. Although the Avanti is 90% aluminium alloy, the fuselage and wing look like they're molded from composites because they're constructed with airframe panels held in place in the jig during assembly by large vacuum pads so that the frames and ribs can be riveted from the inside. This makes for an exceptionally smooth finish and reduces drag. The result is that the Avanti offers superb performance for a turboprop, a cruise ceiling of 41,000 feet with a cabin altitude of only 6,600 feet, cruising around 350, 360 knots in the high 30s, with a fuel burn less than 300 pounds per side, and a range of close to 1,450 nautical miles, which means you can fly 1,000 nautical miles in a little over three hours, burning just 1,600 pounds of fuel. The aircraft is certified for Category 2 instrument landings, steep approaches, and flight into known icing and the Avanti has the ability to operate on short runway lengths of only 1,070 meters at maximum weight. This airframe has also been recertified to increase maximum takeoff weight to 12,100 pounds, allowing an extra two passengers at the maximum fuel load. The cabin provides a stand-up height of 1.75 meters and a width of 1.85 meters, dimensions only bettered by super mid-sized jets. The cabin can seat up to nine in a corporate shuttle layout, but typically seats six in this VIP role with an aft toilet. The Avanti is certified for single pilot operation. The Avanti is a DC electrical aircraft with no APU, but you can use an external power cart to load the FMS prior to start. All engine start and run switches are centrally located in one panel at the forward end of the center console just ahead of the throttles. A rotary test switch on the base of the console is used to check all ancillary systems such as hydraulics, electrics and de-ice and the aircraft can be ready to taxi in three to four minutes after engine start. Avionics include weather radar, traffic avoidance and tours in addition to 8.33 MHz VHF radios, precision RNAV and VNAV this P-180 also has the optional HF radio. Whilst Piaggio has introduced its avionics upgrade of the P-180 Avanti 2 turboprop pusher, the Avanti 1 remains an attractive proposition with its low depreciation combining with its terrific cabin and low operating costs. The Avanti has no natural turboprop competitors, its closest jet rivals being the Raytheon Premier 1 and Cessna Citation CJ1 and 2. If pure top speed is not the overriding criteria, the Avanti's combination of fuel efficiency, cruise speed, range, ceiling and cabin size are hard to beat. The aircraft deserves its Ferrari of the Skies title and can hold its own against any similar size jet. It was said that this aircraft has got no natural turboprop competitor. Okay. So that means there must be something good in turboprops. He constantly says that the nearest competitor is a jet aircraft, it is a business jet. Right. So what is good about turboprops that you should buy a turboprop? That is it, fuel efficiency. Okay, so, if top speed is not the main criteria and if fuel efficiency is a very important consideration, then a turboprop is going to give you better performance, much better, 30 percent, 40 percent lower fuel consumption. Okay, but they fly at 350 knots, 
which is a very high speed. Okay. So, the ability to fly, this is, this is not meant for people like you and me, this is meant for business travelers. It can carry 6 people in the VIP configuration and 9 people in a slightly more compact layout. Okay. And the magic number 9, you understand why it is? Because it is a single pilot configuration. They do not want to get into that area where more than one pilot needs to fly because two pilots will cost more for person. A person who has his own company or her own company, they do not want to have more pilots on board. Okay. So, what are the features you observed in the aircraft that make it stand out from the other aircraft, from the configuration point of view? What was most striking about this aircraft? All right, I think it is already 12.30, I do not want to exceed the time given to us. Uh, this is something that you, you should ponder over. You have seen a film, you have seen it. Now read, read about the aircraft. Okay. And on the Moodle page, Himant, there can be a link, strikingly different features of Piaggio Avanti. And then my fundamental question is, when everything is so nice, why did it fail? Why is it a commercial failure? Read up on that and help us on the Moodle page. Okay.